you guys a little bit about who we are um, and what we're doing here today. Uh, my background is actually in mental health, so I was very excited to be doing this with Elena. And um, you know, when we talked with uh, um, DODD and ODMH, sorry, ODMH. Oh gosh, what is it? ODMH. Well, you guys know what it is. Um, these new numbers <laughs> or these new letters are really hard for me. But um, when we uh, started talking about doing this, it was very exciting for both Kevin and me. Kevin actually is familiar, I think, to many of you guys from DODD, if you've been around for a little bit. Kevin ran policy for the Department of Developmental Disabilities for about four years. So as I said, I was for uh, about three years sort of a liaison between those two departments. And my background is in mental health, as I mentioned. I uh, have an MSW from Ohio State. I actually taught at Ohio State in the MSW program for about a decade um, in clinical social work. And so my friend Kevin, who was running policy at the time, suggested I apply to be the project coordinator for, uh, or the project manager for the Coordinating Center of Excellence. And this is a group who actually knows what that is. Usually I have to explain that. But at the time, what that meant was the same sort of um, partnership that ODMH and DODD are doing. Forgive me, everybody. I'm going to use the old name probably all the way through. So um, I, I was really excited to come to that new world and learn about this new system because the truth is, and I don't always feel great about talking about this, but I, I think um, maybe some of you guys, especially those in mental health, can maybe relate to this. When I was um, in school and then working in community mental health and starting my private practice, um, if you said dual diagnosis to me, what I thought about was mental illness and addiction services, right? So um, it, it was sort of a new world to think about the other dual diagnosis. And um, in fact, that's going to be our next offering, I believe next week, is when I talk about that more general sort of dual diagnosis. And what I quickly came to understand is that understanding mental health issues is incredibly important. Um, because I think in my, what I found was that in the DD world, people were very aware that many of the folks they served also had some kind of mental health diagnosis. At the time, and you know, I would love to hear if people's experiences have changed, we in mental health didn't always necessarily think about DD, right? Especially with some of those people that were, were sort of in that border area where they, they had some impairment, but um, you know, it wasn't always clear how much, because I felt like we didn't necessarily identify DD as an issue, but we knew we didn't have great outcomes with them. In fact, I would say in my experience, those were often some of the worst outcomes we had. And I don't think we had the same awareness. And as we'll talk about next week, um, it, you know, about a third of the folks served in Ohio who have a developmental disability of some kind, which is roughly about 90,000 people, about a third of those folks at some point in their lives will also have a mental health diagnosis. That's 30,000 people. So it was a whole new world for me to learn kind of the other side. And DD was really welcoming and I, I got to travel around Ohio and see all these things that people were doing in counties and regions to support folks with these dual diagnoses. So it was a very exciting time and a, and a time of a lot of growth for me. But there was something that I noticed and this was, oh gosh, over a decade ago now, which is kind of astonishing, but 2009, 2010, as I was, you know, traveling around a lot and, and learning this world, people would talk about different diagnoses than folks that some of their folks had been given. And it would be things like um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, everyone's favorite, my personal favorite, borderline personality disorder, ADHD, and a few other things. But those things in particular, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, really caught my attention because as I had sort of grown up in the mental health world with all the things that I did, I worked a lot with teenagers for a long time. I don't know if any folks out there are, are teenager people. Um, I find that teenagers are kind of the pineapple on pizza of humanity. They very quickly split people into two distinct camps, right? And if you are someone who enjoys working with teenagers, you are, you are, you know, 
that, that is a definite kind of person who enjoys that. I happen to be one of those weird people. Um, so I worked with teenagers. I worked a lot with women. I taught self-defense for a long time. I became interested in trauma early on. And what I knew, especially as I then started teaching about trauma, was that those diagnoses in particular are often misdiagnoses of trauma. We know that from years of research. So, and, and I, of course, want to pause here and, accept, and stay, say very clearly, obviously that doesn't mean that you always are talking about trauma when someone's diagnosed with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. And of course, people can be diagnosed with both things. You can have two things going on at the same time. But I knew that this was something that in the mental health world, we had been familiar with for a while. Um, kind of the, the common wisdom in the mental health world for years and years was that the average person with trauma would get four, four wrong diagnoses before someone landed on the right one. And some of those things that I've mentioned, schizophrenia, bipolar, borderline, uh, ADHD is another one, oppositional defiant, which is a diagnosis I hate and don't understand. I think it's really badly written. I don't get it at all. Um, so, you know, we can argue about that <laughs> later in the comment section. Um, but whatever you're, you're feeling about that is, a lot of these diagnoses were common misdiagnoses of trauma, but this was one of the things where I saw the gap between mental health coming from the mental health world and going into the DD world. Because at that time, I would hear these um, case consults or, or I'd be in team meetings where people would be, uh, you know, working with supporting a particular individual. And trauma did not come up once, not one time in those days. And that really struck me. So that really defined the work that I was to do for the rest of my time at the state, which was really um, encouraging some things that were happening around the state where people were starting to talk about trauma more in the DD world. Um, and I'm happy to say that this has changed by leaps and bounds. Kevin and I, in our consulting work, go all around the country, and um, I think trauma is much more a part of the conversation in developmental disabilities and in the world of dual diagnosis. So things have come forward tremendously since that time 10, 12 years ago. But that was really how I became passionate about talking about trauma with both disciplines, because so many of the individuals that are dually diagnosed are also at such high risk for trauma that we know this will be a part of the picture for so many people that we see. And I'm so excited to be with you guys today and talking about this topic. As I've said, the awareness of trauma has grown tremendously. And so um, many of the places where we go now, if I ask everyone to raise their hand and ask how many of you have had trauma-informed care training of some kind. Mental health has been doing this for a while. So, you know, that's pretty common in, in mental health. But in developmental disabilities, as I've said, now we, we see many more people raising their hand that they've had at least an introduction or some exposure to this. So when we created trauma-responsive care trainings, what we, what we sort of wanted to do to position it is, okay, if you know about trauma, you've been informed about trauma, now here's the next step. Here's how you can respond to trauma. Meaning, when you are dealing with someone where post-traumatic stress or you know, some level of traumatic stress in their life, whether they've ever been diagnosed with PTSD or not, when that is part of the picture, how can we create environments and interactions that not only accommodate that appropriately, but also give them the best chance for post-traumatic growth, for healing from trauma? And as we'll discover today in our short time together, I could talk to you guys all day about this, <laughs> and we have a very brief time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to keep it very focused. Um, but as we talk about this, we'll talk a little bit about what is going on in the brain and the body when someone is in a trauma reaction or is having a flashback, as you may be more familiar with it, and how we can um, support that appropriately. If you are someone who uh, supervises people, let's say you are a... Um, oh, I don't know, you are uh, an administrator for a region or you're a superintendent for a county and you are supporting the staff and the programs who will be supporting people with developmental disabilities and a dual diagnosis of mental illness 
probably involving trauma. These principles will still be a guide for how we can do that and maximize people's opportunities to heal. If you are someone who's in a high leadership position, how do you help this flow downward to all the different systems that you're involved with? Um, if you are someone who deals with families, you do staffings or team meetings and you're dealing with the families of people who are dealing with trauma, how can we uh, be there for them, be present for them, and also maybe do some teaching and edu education about what trauma is and what's going on. All of these things will make life for people with dual diagnoses and trauma better. So we'll be sort of weaving in all those different themes as we talk today. So without any further ado, I am going to um, begin sharing my slides. And this really is where we all come together as a group right? We're all so scattered. Some of you are probably tuning in from all different parts of the state, but here's how we all to come together as one in this moment. And, and this is what I mean. Um, technology and I do not get along. And so I would like everyone to take a moment, if you're jotting notes or, you know, secretly answering emails or something while we're doing this, just pause, put that down, say a prayer up to whatever, you, you know, whatever is up there for you and let's all come together and hope that this actually works okay so here we go and i'm going to try to do this and then i hope you all enjoy my little screensaver and hopefully you can see this and i'll play it from the start i think it worked if anyone can't see the slides let me know but i think we're good okay so I am going to jump ahead to some quotes that um, even with the short time that I have with you, I think this is a really good way for us to kind of orient how we're going to be talking about trauma today. What will strike you right away is I am not going to be talking about, um, you know, this diagnosis or that diagnosis. And I'm really not even going to be talking about um, trauma for people with DD, because I think that like many things that we grapple with in our fields, it, it really kind of serves to separate us that people are so different than we are as if they just work you know in a completely different way emotionally and neurologically and and the truth is that they they don't of course there are some differences um whether someone has another serious persistent mental illness like schizophrenia let's say or if someone has you know significant support needs with developmental disabilities they are on the autism wheel or, or wherever they are so Obviously, there are times when communicating might be more difficult or there are fewer community supports or um, there are other factors that kind of confuse people about what's going on. But I think as we'll, we'll see as we go through this today that trauma is at its heart a human experience. And as we get into the sort of the brain body reactions, there are only so many ways that a brain can respond to a threat. There are only so many ways that our nervous system you know, either gets activated or shuts down. And we are all far, far more alike than we are different. And that really is going to be the theme that carries us through today. So I want to start with some quotes that really describe how I think about trauma, how I, how I talk about trauma. Um, and in fact, some of these names were actually uh, people that I used as textbooks when I taught trauma at the, um, at the MSW program. So Tamsin Cottis, this author I'm gonna to need to introduce to you guys a little bit. She's actually um, an English psychotherapist and she for many years ran, I, she might still, I don't know, um, a mental health clinic in London just for people with developmental disabilities. So let's, again, let's all pause for a second and just imagine that, that somewhere in Columbus or Cincinnati or Cleveland, there was an entire agency that only worked with people with these dual diagnoses. That is amazing to me. I think about that all the time. Anyway, um, she wrote a really great book about it and she talks about the role of trauma with the patients that they treated there. It is worth noting at this point that many patients referred to her clinic seem to have become disabled more by their traumatic life experience than by any congenital impairment. Now this is 
amazing to me. This is, it's deceptively simple, but it really has a radical implication, I think. Imagine what it would be like, let's say in the DD world, where I am new to a county or new to a provider or whatever, and the first things you learn about me are not my, um, the syndrome that I have or the congenital, uh, you know, birth stuff that I have or whatever. The first thing you learn about me as you're trying to do planning and staffing and all of that is my trauma history, if that's known, or how I seem to be around other people, what seems to make me feel scared, what seems to make me feel safe. And I'm not saying that other information isn't important, IQ and you know support scale stuff or whatever, but what if that came second and my trauma history came first? Or imagine those of you who work in the kid mental health world and you're doing an IEP or whatever, and instead of talking first about you know, the behavior issues everyone's having with this kid, you talked about when they feel safe and when they feel scared. And that set the tone for everything to follow. In many cases, that would be a complete reversal of how we do things. Now this next one, I, again, I know that I'm uh, that I've got folks in the audience who are who are you know well informed about trauma, who work with trauma. This name will be very familiar to you guys, um, and for some of you who may not be as familiar, Bessel van der Kolk is probably the best known trauma author in the world. And in fact, his most recent book, The Body Keeps the Score, uh, has been a bestseller. Um, I think on the New York Times list for years, months and months and months. And that is one of the books that I kind of adopted to use as one of my textbooks for the graduate program in trauma. And this was something he said at a training that I attended. Um, and there's actually a lot going on here. So we're going to go through it and we're going to break it down. In fact, the past is the past. And the only thing that matters is what happens right now. And what is trauma is the residue that a past event leaves in your own sensory experiences in your body. And it's not that event out there that becomes intolerable but the physical sensations with which you live that become intolerable and you will do anything to make them go away. As I said, there's a lot going on, so let's break this down. The past is the past and the only thing that matters is what happens right now. This is so important. Uh, for some of you, you may not be doing trauma therapy, you may not be doing you know, day-to-day -day interactions with somebody, but you might be the case manager or you know, um, supervising staff at a provider or uh, whatever it might be, coordinating services. And if you are the person in the room who can help everybody else in the room, staff, family, other providers, whatever it is, understand that the issue of trauma is that it is happening right now. I think that's crucially important because if you don't work with trauma, if you don't have a lot of training in it, it can be really hard to understand why someone seems to be holding on to this thing that happened months, years, sometimes decades ago. I totally get it when the, the, that feeling from families or, or other staff or people surrounding this individual is, well, why don't you just let it go? Or you need closure or just don't think about it. <laughs> and uh, if you work with trauma, if you have people in your own life with trauma, you, you know, you kind of get that, that feeling of like, oh, oh, I should just not think about it. What a great idea. I wish I thought of that. If that's all it took, if trauma were really just in the past and all we needed to do is let it go, we would not be talking about this today. Trauma would not be the, the huge field of study and research and, and therapy that it is. The problem with trauma is that the past keeps happening in the present. And as small and simple as that concept might sound, that is, I think, a fundamental gap in people's understanding. And when people get uh, frustrated or impatient or why are you perseverating on this, your ability to be the person in the room who gets it and who can help other people get it can be incredibly important. So that's the first really big thing. Trauma is not about the past. It is about what keeps happening right now. What is trauma is the residue that a past event leaves in your own sensory experiences in your body. We will be talking about the nervous system and the brain body connection. And it is not that event out there that becomes intolerable, but the physical sensations with which you live. Okay, let's talk about those physical sensations. 
coming into the present. This is actually something I write about in my book. Um, and this is part of what launched me on the road to being um, fascinated by, obsessed with, uh, involved with working with trauma throughout my professional life. So when I, was in, when I was in graduate school, I had a professor named Jim Lance, and I might have some people in the audience today who know that name. He passed away, gosh, it's been 15 or so years now, but anyway, he was my favorite professor, and he uh, had grown up a farm boy not far out of Columbus in a rural area, and when he was a young man, he volunteered to go serve in Vietnam, like many young men did. And he was assigned to a medic unit. And so what that meant was every day for a year, his job was they would get a call over the radio. They would jump into a helicopter, fly to where the fighting was, um, hopefully not breaking a rotor on those thick jungle trees and crashing and everyone dying instantly. Land, hopefully not in the middle of gunfire themselves jump out of the helicopter, hopefully not on a landmine, run out to where the soldiers were, grab the soldiers, and I will not describe to you what he described to us that sometimes happened when they went to pull those soldiers away. Get them onto the helicopter, take off, and fight desperately to keep them alive to fly them back to the medical base. Needless to say, many soldiers did not survive that flight. And I also will not describe to you what he said it was like in the helicopter on that flight back, what he saw and heard and experienced. So he came home, he finished his education, he married a nice lady, uh, became a therapist and a professor. And then one day he and his wife decided to go to the movies right here in Columbus, Ohio. And the movie they went to see was called The Deer Hunter. That may not be a title that's familiar to all of you, but that was one of the first, as I understand it, very graphic, very realistic movies about the Vietnam War. And the story he told to his students for generations after was he does not know what the uh, actual scene was in the movie. That, that information was not available to his brain afterwards. All he knew was that one minute he was sitting in his seat, a professor and a clinician with his wife, the next thing he knew, he was crouched in the middle of the movie theater aisle, screaming, incoming, while his wife and an usher were dragging him out of the theater. So, for those of you who did not know Jim Lance, I can assure you that that was not a choice or a decision that he made to humiliate himself, to disrupt a theater full of strangers, and to terrify his wife. Now, why am I saying that to you? Because th that seems pretty obvious, right? Well, I want you to think about if that had been, um, let's say, a young person in a special ed program in a school on an outing, or uh, an individual with a developmental disability in a group home who'd gone to the movies. Let's just have you know, a little circle of trust here and be honest. What would that person be told when they got back to their classroom or their program or to their group home? We all know the answer, right? <laughs> well, that's the last time you get to do that, or you just lost that privilege because of your, what? Because of your behavior, or because of your poor choices. And then there's some kind of punishment. We won't call it punishment. We might call it losing privileges or time out or whatever. Um, but, but that's essentially what's going on, right? And maybe some shaming as well. So again, what I think is so crucially important to understand is that that was not behavior the way we define behavior. And I will say, I think that's one of the interesting sort of cultural differences between DD and mental health. I don't know if you guys in any of these trainings have talked about this. I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit next week as well. But um, DD remains very behaviorally focused for a lot of reasons that make sense. Um, but one of the things I would hear as I was sort of learning the dual diagnosis world, I would go to a county or a provider or something, and they would say something like, um, oh, Lara's just having a behavior. And as a mental health person, I, I, don't, I don't know, my mental health peeps out there right now, you know, I was always sort of like, what? I think from a mental health perspective, we usually think about behavior as 
very interconnected with thoughts and feelings, right? Um, and, and I think sometimes the behavioral focus in DD, while very useful sometimes, kind of pulls people away from that. And it's almost as if a behavior is just this thing, like I'm going to drive through Starbucks and get, you know, two lattes and a behavior to go. It's, it's very odd to me. But in any case, this would be described as a behavior. And one way we can define behavior in human beings is it's intentional, right? I lift my hand up to my mouth with my cup so that I can take a drink of water. It's a decision I made. If I had a full on grand mal seizure right now, and I fell to the floor and was convulsing on the floor, none of you guys out there would say, wow, she decided to behave very oddly right now. I wonder what her intention was in doing this right? It would be clear to you that it was out of my control. But as we talk about trauma, we will see that, that things like what my professor experienced, what we would commonly call a flashback, was his nervous system reactivating this experience as if it's happening right now. And for those few seconds, it was out of his conscious control. It was neurologically much closer to a seizure than it is a behavior. But if you don't know the context, I get it, right? Um, we might, if I'm a, if I'm an hourly staff person and I've, I've, you know, got a hard shift and a lot of stuff to be responsible for, I can see how I would look at that and go, "Ugh, this person's just trying to make my day difficult," or they're just trying to get attention or whatever. I can see if I'm in the audience of that movie theater and some guy starts screaming and has to be dragged out. Again, circle of trust, let's be honest. What would we all think to ourselves? We would, we would think the C word, right? We'd be like, that guy seems crazy, right? It's, it's very hard when, when a trauma reaction is placing someone so outside of the norm of what everybody else is doing or what's actually going on in that environment. And we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. So, Going on to the last part of this quote, I told you there's a lot going on here. It is the physical sensations with which you live that become intolerable and you will do anything to make them go away. Imagine the level of terror and horror that would activate my professor's nervous system to the point that he would leap out of his chair and scream. I won't ask you guys to share your scariest experiences, but if you can do this just a little bit, just touch in for a second on, on a time that maybe you felt some part of that, of that part of fear or panic. And now imagine that that might come over you at any time with no warning. What would you be willing to do to make that stop? Well, I can tell you what I would be willing to do if I had no other means of, of coping with it and stopping it. I would drink, I would use drugs, I would overeat, I would starve myself, I would cut myself, I would compulsively shop, compulsively gamble, have sex with inappropriate people, lash out at people violently, you name it, I would do it. If that was all I had to make it stop. And most importantly, so would you. In this training, when van der Kolk said this, he looked out at the audience and he said, you will do anything to make them go away. And he didn't say, you know, if you're a messed up vet or uh, if you've got somebody with disabilities or there's something, you know, morally weak about you. He said you, and he meant you and me and him and anybody in the right set of circumstances lacking other tools, we would do any of those things. And so, as I said at the beginning, as we talk about trauma, we can talk about what are the complications if you also have a developmental disability or what happens when you're disempowered already because you're, you're a child or, or a teenager that's getting on people's nerves or you know, whatever it is. Um, you've experienced something very specific in, in um, you know, combat trauma that it is hard for other people to relate to. Those are absolutely factors and complications. But when we boil it all down, as I said, this is a human experience of, when we have intolerable levels of fear and horror and, and terror, we will do anything to make it stop. And finally, um, the simplest quote here, but in some ways for me, the most 
heartbreaking and and the most elegant. Pierre Genet, if you know much about sort of the, the field of trauma and how we how it developed, along with neurology and psychology and lots of other things, um, Pierre Genet is, uh, was a 19th century French neurologist and his work, along with Charcot and others, were really the foundation that Freud and, and sort of the next generation of scientists used to create our modern understandings of things like the brain and also the mind. And Genet said this, Trauma is a disease of not being able to be here. And I, I think this, this not only sums up so beautifully what it's like to live with levels of trauma that sometimes take you out of yourself, where you don't know when and where or who you are in those moments, or create this barrier between you and other people. It also means that when it's severe enough, you don't get to live the life that you could otherwise live. Think about the people that you work with who go from classroom to classroom, school system to school system, um, work setting to work setting, housing to housing, because their trauma gets in the way of being able to be appropriate or to respond in a, in a measured and thoughtful way to their environment. We'll see, again, very briefly, how trauma doesn't just create you know, particular triggers, but depending on how early it starts, how severe it is, how frequent it is, can affect everything about who someone is. And maybe, maybe this is another way of, of saying why I'm so passionate about doing this and why I'm so grateful to have this time with you guys. Because as we'll see today and, and next week as well, your knowledge of this, your understanding of this, and your ability to either implement that with someone or support other people in understanding better and supporting better can be the best chance someone has to get to actually come back here and live their life here that they were meant to live. So speeding along, um, I'm not going to spend a lot. Oops, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on definitions, but just to sort of orient us, trauma is really anything that can make you feel like you're about to die, or that is emotionally overwhelming or annihilating. So um, let's use this example. Let's say that I'm on 71, and I a car is coming into my lane, and I have to swerve out of the way, and I roll my car into a ditch, and uh, I'm not badly injured. Maybe I'm conscious, but uh, I'm trapped. Might I feel that I'm about to die? trapped in my car, maybe I can't get free, I'm waiting for them to cut me out, the car might explode at any moment. Yes, absolutely, I might be afraid that I'm about to die. Um, now let's use a different scenario. And uh, I, this group in particular, I'm so excited to be talking to you guys because I think a lot of you um, already you know, completely get what I'm about to say. So let's imagine that I'm four years old and I live in a household where there's a lot of violence, a lot of uh, screaming and yelling and throwing things and the cops are called and the whole thing. But for whatever reason, no one is ever hitting me. I am not physically hurt at all, but I am witnessing this. Sometimes at night I'm lying in bed and I can hear this. Might I, at four years old, experience an overwhelming level of fear and panic um, to, to the extent that it's, to use a really good word, kind of emotionally annihilating. Yeah, absolutely. And some brain scans have suggested that if you look at the brains of people who've had very different kinds of trauma, childhood sexual trauma, combat sold trauma from a soldier, and I think another set of scans was done of someone who'd been in a long-term abusive marriage, the, the changes in brain activity and in some cases actual you know, brain volume in some areas of the brain, the changes look the same. So when we are working with someone or we are training staff or whatever, those specifiers of intimate partner violence or combat trauma or childhood sexual assault or whatever it is, again, there are some specifics to those things. But our brains and body, we, we, there's only so many things we can do. And so when we think about trauma, it's really important to keep in mind that it might be something that is an actual danger. I might actually be in danger of, of you know, being badly injured or, or killed, or it could be something that is emotionally uh, unendurable, okay? And why that is so important, again, many of you guys kind of already get this, but in many of the systems in which we care for people, DD, mental health, corrections, education, whatever, we're normally pretty good at keeping people safe. 
right? This comes up in DD a lot, actually. If I'm talking with a, a DD audience, let's say to county or state or provider, um, and we talk about the fear of, of dying, people will say, well, I don't get it. This person, you know, they live day to day in a very safe way. It's the fear that causes the brain change and the body change, right? So even if I'm not in danger of dying, but I think I am, or it's emotionally overwhelming, we see the same changes to the brain and body. Okay, now this list, again, is gonna be familiar to everybody. Um, sometimes trauma therapists refer to these as big T trauma. One way to think about it is this only has to happen to you once to potentially have life altering consequences. Okay, so physical assault, sexual assault, physical sexual abuse, verbal or emotional abuse and manipulation, war, uh, disaster, catastrophic illness, traumatic grief, severe bullying. Now, these kinds of things, obviously, some of them absolutely can be ongoing, but they also could be a single event, a single sexual assault, a single um, natural catastrophe, let's say. So if I told you guys that I survived uh, Hurricane Katrina and I have ongoing um, symptoms of PTSD from that, you would not be confused. You would not say, really? Just You just went through that one historic flood? Huh. Hmm. Oh, okay. Right? You would get it. It, it, it can be a, a, a single catastrophic event. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this given the time that we have, but there's some kind of common sense things to keep in mind that not everyone's going to experience the, an event the same way. And there are some things that might make an event more or less likely to potentially cause trauma for someone. And as I said, they're pretty common sense. How long did it last? How intense was it? Time of day, fun fact, we could take uh, something like, let's say a mugging, and imagine that it happens uh, in a Kroger parking lot in, at 12 o'clock noon or 12 o'clock midnight. All other factors being equal, people might be more likely to experience ongoing trauma afterwards if it happened at, does anyone wanna guess? That's right, I'm gonna pretend I can hear you. Midnight, correct. Because if we can't orient ourselves, we can't see what's coming, we may experience that as more of a loss of control. Um, when human beings can feel oriented and we understand what's happening, that can lend us a sense of control, even if that doesn't, in, in actuality, change the outcome of anything. So you should already be thinking about some folks in the DD world or kids who are in um, uh, overwhelming, confusing, let's say, classrooms or home situations. Sometimes it's not even so much about what's happening as much as it is, or at least it includes, I don't understand what's going on. Hmm. Um, some of these things relate to that same thing. Uh, did I have any warning? Was it intentional? All that kind of stuff. The last thing on the list is probably the most important. Coping skills and support system, or, or I would say support system around that person, support immediately after the, the event. Um, those have been shown to be some of the most um, important factors to determine whether people are going to experience an event as traumatizing. And we have the same thing in here internally. So some intrinsic factors, a history or a family history of any kind of mental health diagnosis or emotional issue, um, some inherent factors of resilience. We think that resilience, as many of you guys work with, train with, all of that, resilience is um, a big emerging field and complex, but we suspect that there's probably at least some genetic component to it as well. Substance abuse makes handling trauma or stress worse in the long run. But you'll notice that I skipped the first one, a previous history of traumas or stressors or abuse. Now, in doing this training right now, as we're talking about it, that makes sense, right? Oh, yeah, if you've already had this experience, more of it might make it worse. But we don't always play that out that way. And I'll give you an example. Depending on who the person is, we can see them as more vulnerable to trauma or less vulnerable. Um, I had an experience uh, in an agency, you know, in a, in a different area um, where I was doing some brief consulting uh, to do some clinical supervision where um, their clinical supervisor had left and there was a sort of a gap and they needed someone to sign off on a backlog of histories and diagnoses that had been taken. This is a child serving agency. And I went through these histories and they served a wide range of kids, but a lot of them were um, 
uh, inner city, exposed to a lot of poverty and violence early on in life, all that kind of stuff. Many, although not all of them, were boys, and many of them were boys of color. And as I read through these histories, which were carefully taken, and then the diagnoses that they've been given, either by that agency or sometimes, you know, historically from other providers, um, I watched to see how many people looked at these environments that these kids had been exposed to and the, the symptoms they were showing and how many times they were diagnosed with trauma, especially if they were a boy of color. Would anyone like to try to guess the number out of about 200 cases? I will tell you. Zero. I don't mean, wow, there weren't very many. I mean the numeral zero. And that highlighted for me personally something that we already know through lots of research, which is that when we assess people or diagnose people, we are human beings and we can be influenced by our own culture and biases. And so sometimes there's a difference between, let's talk about kids from this example, kids who look sad and if they are a girl and especially a white girl, we are more likely to see them as vulnerable and worthy of protection. And we are more likely to diagnose them with an emotional diagnosis, an emotional disorder, let's say depression or anxiety. We know from multiple studies that if that person is seen as somehow intimidating or threatening, and in the kid world, if they are male, and if they are a male of color, a, a boy of color, they're more likely to be given a behavioral diagnosis, disruptive behavior disorder. I would still like someone to explain that one to me. Um, oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD. Some kids look bad, sad, some kids look bad. So how this plays out in terms of previous history of trauma is that if you get a kid who's being seen through that behavioral lens, especially if they have sort of a tough exterior or they've adapted some behavioral strategies like, um, you know, being hard or aggressive or whatever um, to sort of keep themselves safe, we're more likely to hear things like, oh, that kid's a survivor. They've been through it all. They're tough. Nope. Underneath a fairly thin layer of hardness or bravado or whatever, we see just as much vulnerability. And every new trauma makes that worse until they get treated for the trauma, right? So it may seem obvious to say a previous history of trauma leaves you more vulnerable to the, the impact of the next one, but that's not always how it plays out in services. Um, okay, yeah, I feel like it's really important to talk about that stuff, and if it seems like I'm upset about it, it's because I am. Now, the last thing on this list, difficult relationships or poor attachment to others. This is really, really important for many people we serve, but especially folks in the DD system or people with severe persistent mental illness who may struggle with being unhoused or whatever it is, that if you don't have a lot of healthy, positive relationships in your life and preferably natural ones, that's not to dismiss how important we are to some of the folks we serve, but it, it, it tends to be more powerful if someone's not being paid to know you, right? That, that when people lack those things, it makes them much less resilient to trauma. And this is especially devastating if the trauma has been caused by another person, which is much of what we deal with, probably almost exclusively in the DD world. I think in mental health, you do see more people who've had um, other things happen in their lives. But generally speaking, I think uh, with the developmental disabilities world, we're talking about interpersonal trauma, right? Most of them have not been in a serious car accident or a, you know, a mine cave in or something like that. Okay, so I now want you guys to look at this list. Um, poverty, racism and oppression, not being accepted, not being able to do something other people can do. Moving to a new home or significant disruption at home. Uh, knowing that you're different from the people around you in some way, not being listened to, being misunderstood, or failing at a task. Um, one of the things that, that also sometimes is on this list, I don't know why I dropped it off, is feeling confused and overwhelmed. All right. Now, when you look at this list, it may seem strange, especially after poverty and racism, if we kind of jump down to the next ones. Um, not being accepted not being able to do what other people can do, uh, being misunderstood. We could just call those events seventh grade, 
right? Like some of the things on this list um, can happen to anybody and, and will happen to everybody at some point in their lives, right? If I were live with you guys, I might say, please raise your hand if you've never ever experienced anything on this list ever. And none of you would raise your hands, right? Because again, we all had to go through middle school. So why is it that these things are being included in a, in a training about trauma where previously we've talked about catastrophic life altering events that could happen to someone? Well, um, let's, let's take an example on this list. Let's do failing at a task. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. And I'm not going to ask you to share this. So this is just for you, but I want you to take a moment and again, sort of put your distractions down. Just let yourself focus on this for a moment. And I want you to think about a time in your life that you failed at something. And I don't mean something like, you know, oh, well, I, I guess I'm just, you know, skiing's not for me. Um, but I mean something that was important to you, something that you, you practiced and tried hard at, or maybe people saw you fail and you failed at it. How did that feel? And if I could see all of your faces right now, I know what I would see, that for some of you, I would actually see a change of like, uh, I know for me, when I think about this, I, you know, I, I don't like how that feels. It's very, um, you know, it's very visceral for me. That is an unpleasant feeling. And now I want you to think about what you do when you fail at something. And without knowing you guys, I already know the answer. For, for most, if not all of you, uh, there are a couple of things in place. The first one is you probably have people in your life who care about you, who are not paid to be there, who can give you those pep talks, right? I think you're the bee's knees. Go get them, champ. It'll be better next time. I don't know if everybody that you know talks like that. Maybe that's just me. Um, although I do think we should be telling people more often that they're the bee's knees. So you've got that, that, that support system around you to help hold you up, to help you deal with the unpleasant or, or difficult feelings and to feel encouraged. And you also probably have some pretty good strategies to use, right? So you either you know, study harder or get extra help, you know, try, try, try again until you can turn it into a success. Or you have multiple options in your life where you can say, wow, this is not the direction for me where I can be successful. I'm going to go in a different direction and I'll be successful that way. Sounds great, right? Now I want you to think about people with developmental disabilities, um, young people with, who, who have um, uh, emotional uh, burdens or who have, um, you know, gosh, I can't think of the word now in education, but they've been classified as emotionally and behaviorally struggling. They, they struggle in a typical classroom setting. Do they always have that robust cheering section? Do they always have a wide range of skills and strategies by which they can create success for themselves after a failure? No. Many, many, many of them do not. And so what becomes traumatic is not the magnitude of the event, but the frequency and the inability to turn it into it, something else. I'm, I'm going to confess something to you guys. I kind of cheated. I knew which one on this list to pick for you. I knew that if I picked failing, many of you would have that ugh, feeling about it and have a robust system for dealing with it. And the reason I already know that without having met you guys is you guys are really good at being successful. And I know that because you guys all have really important, responsible jobs. So I already knew that about you. So now imagine what it would feel like to go back to that oh feeling, except instead of happening every once in a while or you know something you can put a different ending on or whatever, now imagine that you feel that multiple times a day, maybe every day, maybe week after month, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. What happens? What happens is that cumulatively, these little traumas, or what we sometimes call little T traumas, start cumulatively becoming big T traumas. So we've got big T trauma, a single, perhaps single devastating event. It can also, of course, be ongoing and chronic. Little T traumas 
repeated small events that make you feel helpless, misunderstood, devalued, or powerless. And this is one of my favorite quotes. And some of you guys actually know Steve Click. I'm so excited um, because he works at um, ODMHAS. I'm trying, you guys. Um, working with first responders and trauma. So he was a friend of mine and he gave me this quote that he uses in his trainings and I love it. So I use it. Um, I even put it in my book. Big T trauma is like being attacked by a bear and little T is like being attacked by ducks, right? If someone's attacked by a bear, you can see that damage pretty, quite, pretty quickly. Um, if it's an occasional duck every once in a while, that's something somebody can deal with, but given enough time and enough ducks, and the damage starts to look the same. So um, I want to leave this here. We are going to take our break now. So we will come back at, let me see, it's 10.56. So we will come back at 11.06. And we're gonna pause here so that if folks have any comments or questions, we can get to those. Um, also during your break, I, I encourage you guys to get up, walk around, do stuff. Um, but also if you have a question or a thought that's come up for you during the first half of the morning, go ahead and put it in that Q and A section. Uh, looks like we don't have any right now. So we'll go ahead and go on our break and I will check to see if there are any comments or observations or questions when we get back at 1106. See you guys then. Okay, so um, Lori shared that this was helpful information. Great. Yushan, uh, I believe Kevin is going to try to put some resources into the, the Q&A section for you. And with that, let's go ahead and share the screen again and get back to those slides. Now, this one I'm going to talk about in more detail next week, but I will just point out that when we talk about what trauma affects, we're not just talking about tr triggers, right? So like if I said to uh, my professor, like, maybe you shouldn't go to more movies about Vietnam. Like, that's probably a decent suggestion. But trauma can affect how we are in our body, how we process information coming in, how we fall asleep, digest food and fight off disease, how we react and judge the intentions of others. Many of you, for example, who work with adolescents are very familiar with um, the hair trigger reaction that some kids can have, and that's a lot of what's getting them into trouble, right? They, they throw that punch or they, they do that thing long before they've had time to accurately assess what's happening around them. Um, how we understand emotions and feel empathy for others. I'll just say this, and again, we'll talk about this a little bit more next week, but in order to feel empathy for someone, we kind of have to bounce their feelings off of ours a little bit. This happens in fractions of a second, but when I look at Elena, let's say, and I can see that her face is like this and she's got tears coming down her face, in microseconds that kind of bounces off my inner experience and I go, oh, okay, that, that makes me feel sad. She must be feeling sad. Oh, okay, I get it, she's sad. When I can't do that, if I've shut everything down so that I don't feel that terror and horror and panic, um, and walk around kind of numb and dissociated, which we're gonna talk about next, then there's nothing to bounce off of. And this also, I think, contributes to why some people are diagnosed as lacking empathy or looking sociopathic. Some of them are sociopaths, but some of them, what actually may be happening is they're walking around in a frozen state from unassessed and untreated trauma. But it kind of makes you look like you don't have any emotions and that you don't have any empathy. Um, how you take risks, tolerate discomfort, how you see yourself and other people. Again, we will, we will touch on that more next week, but really the point of these slides is to say, as we start understanding that trauma may be present in someone's life, it is not just about chasing down all the triggers. Number one, we, we can't always figure out why someone gets triggered. If you've worked with trauma, you know that people will tell you, yeah, I know some things that trigger me, but sometimes I get triggered and I have no idea what it was. It's almost like if the alarm circuitry in your brain is like a smoke detector in your kitchen. And imagine that you burn toast. And of course it goes off, right? That's what it's supposed to do. And then the next time you're just making toast and it hasn't burned yet, but it goes off because it's been sensitized. And now it's just because you're boiling eggs. And then the next time you're just making a sandwich. And pretty soon some people get to the point where 
it's as if in this crazy analogy, you're upstairs asleep. You're, no one's in the kitchen at all. And the, the system starts to set itself off. So triggers and things like that can be very helpful in terms of sort of laying the groundwork with people. But if we focus too much on triggers, much like as we'll talk about in a moment, focusing too much on knowing a history, we kind of miss the point. Now, um, I'm going to zoom through the rest of these. I'm not gonna talk about trauma symptoms because I think most of you guys are familiar with this, but also because I really will be going through uh, how trauma is diagnosed next week. So we're gonna skip hypervigilance, avoidance, intrusion, and negative alterations in cognition and mood, which is an, a perfect example of the DSM making things as dry as possible. But that really just means trauma does a number on your mood and how you think about things in the world. Okay, so again, we'll go into more detail next week, so I'm going to zoom through those because I have so much to say and so little time to be with you. Now, when we are faced with something that is a potential threat in our environment, as animals, there are only five possible things we can do. And some of these things are um, things we see more in like mammals and primates, um, but basically we can retreat, attack, or shut down. Like that's it right? So let's talk about when we get adrenalized into a reaction. Most of you are familiar with the term fight or flight. We all know this. This is when you get that flood of adrenaline and cortisol in your body triggered by, by norepinephrine and cortisol in your brain, which we'll talk about again in a moment. So fight, flight, we get it. We're going to fight the bear or we're going to run away from the bear. For most of you, unless you're super fit, I'm going to suggest running away from the bear. Okay. But now here are two more, and conveniently, they all fit into the F theme that you may be less familiar with, but that are also part of that adrenalized or what we sometimes call a hyper arousal state. Your nervous system has been hyper activated. So fight or flight. But then we also have freeze. And freeze is like when a rabbit runs out in front of your car right? Especially like at night, you can see it in your headlights and you can, the rabbit is still, but it's still at a high state of tension, right? If you stop to look, you'd see the rabbit is like practically vibrating, right? And as soon as you swerve your car out of the way, what's going to happen? Boom, that rabbit's going to take off. So it's stillness, but at high activation, right? And it usually doesn't last super long. And then the last one you may have heard previous iterations of this as tend and befriend. I like this one a little better. Fawn, in this example, doesn't refer to a baby deer. Fawning means all the ranges of behavior that move closer to a threat to neutralize it. So smiling, being placating, being appeasing, um, being overly friendly, even flirtatious or seductive or sexual. These are really fear reactions. They just don't look like fear, maybe. And of course, as many of you will already have noticed, these are often behaviors that have been kind of socialized in women and female identifying people. So there may be a lot of social cues that kind of lead females to do this more, although we absolutely can see it as men, in men as well. And again, I think for those of you in DD world, you may see this when you see what we sometimes refer to as the disability smile. Whenever someone goes, oh, I just love working with Lara. She's always happy. I always go, Pah, right? I, maybe I try not to do that in front of them, but I, I just think that's BS a lot of the time. There are some people who are pretty sunny. Absolutely. And there are even some syndromes that, that kind of lend themselves to that over friendliness. But Generally speaking, I think when we see that person who's always happy, what we may be seeing at least part of the time is that they have figured out that smiling and appearing friendly and pleasant um, prevents things that might frighten them or, or be difficult, and it may bring them more of what they want and need from people, the disability smile. It's not because they're happy all the time. And so I think it's important to start thinking about folks we work with or people that we're serving in our systems or whatever that don't look like the stereotypical fight or flight that may look like some of these things. Now, as I said, there, there are sort of three things we can do. This first set of things is in that adrenalized, I'm going to be mobilized in some way to deal with this threat. But going in the other direction, now we have collapsing and dissociating. 
So um, in the previous example, I talked about stillness at a high state of tension when someone is hyper aroused, hyper activated. We can also see when people go in the opposite direction and they become hypo aroused or under activated. And this is stillness, but it's at a state of collapse. So I want you to imagine that same rabbit except this time instead of frozen in front of the car and ready to dart the rabbit's been caught by a coyote and the rabbit is limp in the coyote's jaws like this right they're not stiff as a board their muscles are soft they've given up they've checked out and many of you probably did not know that there was going to be a theater component to this training me playing the part of a rabbit you're welcome but anyway, you kind of get what we're talking about here. So another metaphor that I've seen people use that I really like is whatever building you're in right now, if you're in an office building or home or whatever, imagine that the fire alarm system goes off. So you've got the fire alarm blaring, you've got maybe emergency lights coming on, there may be some lights flickering, you can hear a fire truck screaming down the street. That's hyper arousal. Everything is blaring, everything is activated. Hypo arousal is being in a building where the utilities have been cut, the power has been cut. It's dark, it's cold, there's safety perhaps, but in complete inactivity, okay? So that's collapse, and it's often associated with dissociating. Dissociating is a word many of us have heard, and in one way to think about it really simply is that it just means two things that are usually connected together are now separated. And sometimes this just lasts for a matter of seconds. My professor was dissociated when he kind of lost track for a few seconds of where and when he was, right? He didn't perceive himself to be in that movie theater in Columbus. He perceived himself to be 25 years earlier in Vietnam, right? So it can be a separating of like self from time and place. It can also be so profound that we hear the more extreme examples of this that are fairly rare of people like missing time, waking up in a new city, stuff like that. We used to call that multiple personality disorder in the 70s and 80s, and I was obsessed with that and <laughs> read all the books about it. Um, now, of course, many of you know it's, it's actually described as dissociative identity disorder. Um, it, and, th and that still is, you know, a pretty extreme form of what we're talking about, that the, the entire sense of self has kind of been fragmented. Um, but if you think of dissociation on a continuum, there's a form of dissociating that's much more common. It, this is built into our um, repertoire in our brains and bodies. Again, we are all much more alike than we are different. So here's an example of dissociating that's perhaps uh, an everyday thing that you find yourself doing. So you're driving home from work, it's a familiar route, and you're thinking about, you know, a conversation you had with someone at work, or this amazing training you attended in the morning, or whatever it is, and you arrive home and you're like, oh, I don't really remember driving those last few miles. Your brain was so occupied with what you were thinking about that you you kind of checked out and your brain is so automatic when it comes to driving if driving is driving this route in particular is something you've done a lot of that your brain can kind of go on automatic pilot and you can drive home without incident while your brain is very occupied somewhere else dissociation can also be a, a shift in perception so sometimes when people dissociate and those of you in kid world if you deal with childhood trauma you will know exactly what i'm talking about there can be a splitting of perception of being in the body so it's not uncommon for kids to say something like when xyz was about to happen i would just leave my body and go into my stuffed animal or it was like i was watching it happen to another kid um Another form of dissociating that is more subtle, but I think is really endemic to trauma, we see this a lot, is the separating of words and feelings. So, for example, I've done some pro bono work with the refugee community, and some people, many refugees have seen unimaginable levels of trauma. And one gentleman in particular, I will always remember, had experienced torture as a political prisoner. And he, I only saw him a few times. And when he came in, um, I, I, I think I started with something in one of our early sessions, like, you know, how are you doing or how are things going? I would never have asked him to talk about his trauma. We were nowhere near that. And I don't usually work with narrative anyway, but 
Anyway, he, without prompting, launched into the story of all the things that had been done to him. And it was like watching someone push a play button on a recording. Uh, as far as I know, all the, all the events were accurate and in the right order, but he said these horrifying things with no expression on his face and no expression in his voice. It was like watching someone read off a grocery list. And what he was saying was so horrifying. And, and I've worked with trauma for going on 30 years. I had to fight really hard not to burst into tears just hearing it. But there was no connection to any emotion. And I make a point of this example to say that I also think this can lead into why some people look traumatized to us and maybe some people don't. So if we go back to what we talked about before, imagine some people that you're working with, especially a male, especially male of color, if they have that dissociated reaction and they're saying things um, with that sort of emotionless presentation, we can look at that and see lack of empathy. We can look at that and see sociopath. What we may actually be seeing is dissociation from trauma. So, when we talk about arousal, you'll sometimes hear therapists talk about a window of tolerance. And that is where most of us, if we haven't had overwhelming amounts of trauma in our lives, it's where most of us spend our time. So here we have hyper arousal, right? The survival system that we absolutely need that activates us to get away from danger or to somehow neutralize the threat. And then we have hypo arousal when we kind of check out. This is probably a built-in reaction, especially for prey animals. If I'm about to be eaten by a tiger, I don't need to stick around for that, right? And for some animals like a possum, maybe when I go into that collapse state and I play dead, I'm gonna be left alone. I just saw a video that Bruce Perry did. Many of you in kid world will know that name. And he talked about a, a, the example of a possum versus a deer. So a deer bolting away might be in hyper arousal. A possum that collapses and looks dead can be in hypo arousal. And we are all built as animals, as mammals, as primates to move in between those two states. What we're not built to do is to have that happen constantly or to be in an ongoing state of it. Someone once described hyper arousal as running away from a tiger and hypo arousal is the tiger lives at your house. How would you be in the world if there were a tiger living with you in your house? You'd be pretty quiet and pretty shut down, right? So these, these extremes that we go to as a matter of survival that are meant to be these emergency systems, when they are activated in us over and over and over and over, what we see happening is that window narrows. And so when we're working with people who've had extreme trauma, where trauma has happened early in childhood, because developmentally, that level of stress starts to change how the brain wires itself in the early years of life. When trauma has been ongoing and it's chronic for a number of years, we see people whose window of tolerance becomes much, much more narrow, and they spend way more of their time in hyper arousal or hypo arousal. And that's when we start hearing things about who we think someone is. You know, Laura's a stone cold sociopathic criminal. Well, maybe. Or maybe I spent a lot of time checked out and dissociated in hypoarousal. Or Lara's an explosive pain in the butt and she's got a, you know explosive behavior disorder or whatever. I'm sorry, I keep bragging on these diagnoses. <laughs> we can talk about it. Um, it's probably an issue that I need to work through. But you know, Lara's a problem or she's attention seeking or she creates chaos or blah. We start talking about it as if it's who I am. Whereas Perry likes to say, the state becomes a trait people start associating this with just what I am. If I have a developmental disability, sometimes that's written off as a behavior. Lara's having behaviors today, when what might be much more accurate and appropriate is, Lara's in a, a high state of hyper arousal today, or whatever. So moving along, I can talk so much more about all of this stuff, but I'm gonna do this really fast. Bruce Perry, going back to him, likes to say, people usually want to teach other people from the top down, but the brain actually works from the bottom up. Meaning, if you've got that smoke detector going off in your house or the fire alarm is going off in your building, before you can do anything else, you need to shut that off. You need to clear out whatever, if there's a real danger, get them out of the real danger, right? Get the smoke out of the room, put out the fire. But when we're talking about trauma, what we're really talking about is people who live with a fire system that goes off randomly. 
sometimes occasionally, sometimes it's nearly constant. And in order to get them to do anything we're asking them to do, this might be a kid in a classroom or an individual to group home, or for some of you guys, a staff person that you're supporting or a colleague or whatever it is, because we're all humans here. Before someone can do anything else, their brain needs to be back online. They need to be back in their window of tolerance. Because when we are in a state, I won't go back to the slide, but when we are in hyper or hypo arousal, we're in a survival state. And if we could watch the activity in someone's brain, what we would see is that that kind of thinking cortex at the top of the brain that does the decision making and evaluating and should I do this or should I not do that? The part of the brain where my professor might have been able to say, I probably should not jump out of my chair and start screaming, therefore I won't. That is offline. It gets, as you may have heard, hijacked by the safety systems of the brain. Like if you're in a building where the, the usual exits and the elevators are cut off and you've got the emergency lights and the emergency exits, it's for survival. It totally makes sense. But your thinking brain has relatively little activity going on. And yet, in many of these systems where we work, there are settings in which people are told things like, use your words, or you made a bad choice. Things that literally are not possible neurologically in that moment when we're in that, that hyper or hypo arousal state, when we're out of our window. Our brain just isn't working that way. So when Perry says we have to actually work from the bottom up, what he's saying is people have to be made to feel safe and in control before they can do anything else. Safe means, again, maybe there's an actual danger and you need to get me away from the danger. But often what we're talking about is they need to feel safe. Being safe and feeling safe can be two completely different things, right? In that movie theater, my professor was physically safe. There was no gunfire. He was not in danger, but he didn't feel safe because of the survival protocols that had been triggered by whatever was in that movie or what have you. And in control doesn't mean I've been promoted to boss of everyone else and I get to boss everyone around or you know, change the rules of the program I'm in or whatever it is. It just means my thinking brain and my feeling brain and my acting brain, however you wanna describe it, moving my body, thinking my thoughts, making my choices, those are all online. I'm back in my window of tolerance and to whatever extent is, is typically available to me, which may be you know, not great at the best of times, um, you know, depending on what other stuff you're supporting me for, but what, to whatever extent I can, I can think and make choices. And now you're talking about my behavior. Before, when I was in that hyper hypo arousal, I was reacting. I wasn't behaving. So <clears throat> here's how we're going to wrap up today. You'll notice that safe and in control are, are kind of the two pillars on either side. And if you look at a lot of trauma-informed care models from SAMHSA or Covenant model or whatever, you'll see those two pillars. It may be in different language, but it, they boil down to helping people feel safe, helping people empowered, blah, 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 and giving people choices, helping them to, you know, getting them self-advocacy or advocacy, helping them to be in control, right? Great. What trauma-responsive care has added is connected. Now, why is that in there? Because as we wrap up our time today, we'll talk just for a moment about how the brain actually works. Your brain can do, and I believe this is the correct term, 11 jillion different things in the course of your life. Your brain is extraordinarily complex, and we are just beginning to understand some of that complexity. But our brains are also organized on some very simple principles. And one of them is, and you might want to write this down, on and off. Anything our brain does, we have a way to turn it on or start it, and we have a way to extinguish it or turn it off. Otherwise, I would lift my hand and start scratching my nose, and I would never stop until my nose fell off, right? And these fear reactions that we've talked about, the four Fs, or collapse and dissociate, those are turned on in the brain. There's an on switch. The on switch is, among other neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and cortisol. Remember I said we'd come back to that. And that triggers the reaction to release adrenaline from the adrenal glands on top of the kidneys and that knocks people out of their window into fight, flight, freeze, fawn, or to collapse and dissociate. And that's really important. That's not a bad thing. That's what allows us to survive. That's why we've survived and evolved for millions of years because we have these deeply written survival codes, right? But 
If there's a way to turn it on, there has to be a way to turn it off. And the off switch, chemically speaking, is dopamine and serotonin. Probably heard of those, right? And some others, oxytocin. And what those chemicals do when our brains start releasing those things, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, they go in and they break down the norepinephrine and the cortisol. They literally break it down and clear it away. So if there's an on switch for fear, the off switch is dopamine and serotonin. Now, how do we release dopamine and serotonin? Well, we've all been doing a lot of that in the past two years, right? We've been sitting on a comfy couch under a blanket. We've been eating delicious snacks. None of them were kale. There's a reason why kale is not a comfort food. Um, please get in touch with me if kale is your comfort food. Um, uh, online shopping, gambling, sex, drugs, basically all the things that human beings like are ways that we release dopamine and serotonin. But the, one of the fastest, most powerful ways to get a human brain to release dopamine and serotonin is connection with another caring human being. Or another way to say that might be love. Now that might be the, the kind and warm voice of, uh, you know, the, the 911 operator on the other end of the phone. It might be your best friend for 30 years. But when we can position ourselves to be grounded and kind and compassionate and present with someone who is out of their window of tolerance, we get their brains to start releasing dopamine and serotonin. And that is the fastest way to get their brain back online, the fastest way to get them back into their window of tolerance. Now, some people who've had a lot of trauma and they spend a lot of time out of their window, fast might still be pretty slow. It might take a while, but that is one of the ways we turn the tide and get that person to come back into being in their lives here and now and not lost in the past. One of my favorite verses, and we'll wrap up with this, um, from the entire Bible is from the book of John. Perfect love casteth out fear. And John happened to be exactly neurologically correct. Love is stronger than fear. So when you are out there working directly with people or, um, you know, supervising and, and managing programs that allow people to, to work with people directly, and you create these opportunities in which people can have these connected interactions, and they can be made to feel safe, connected, and in control over and over and over and over and over, you are helping their brains experience something different. And that is how we see that window start to widen. That is how we start to see what we would call healing from trauma. Another way to think of it is this. We're gonna talk about all that other stuff later. Mm -hmm. But we'll wrap up with this just for the time that we have today. It is the relationship that heals people. Psychotherapeutic interventions and medications to manage symptoms and all of that stuff. I'm a trauma therapist, I love all of that. But I know that what actually helps brains change is the experience in connection with another kind and caring human being. And so as we wrap up today, I want to take the, the liberty of thanking you guys for being the people who create the circumstances in which those experiences and relationships can happen. Thank you from all the people who can't thank you themselves for what you do. And thank you for your time today. I so appreciate you guys. I appreciate DODD and ODMHAS for putting on this training. Um, I know we are over our time a little bit. I will stay for questions if folks have them. And otherwise, I hope to see many of you guys next week. So thanks, everybody. Fantastic presentation. Holy cow, thank you so much. Um, I just want to throw a quick uh, reminder that yes, we are, this presentation was recorded and uh, we do have um, a copy of an abbreviated PowerPoint that will be made available to you all um, after the training. Um, and then also uh, for continuing education credits, I dropped the survey. It's a really long link, forgive me for that, but it's a survey monkey link that will take you to the evaluation so we can make sure you get your continuing education credits. Thank you so much, Elena. I really appreciate that. Again, I'm so excited to get to be doing this with everybody. Um, Sarah had a question. How do we get an invite to the next session? I think the next session is, is going to be publicized in the same way that this was. So Elena, I don't know if you want to put anything else in that section for folks 
um, where they can go to find out more about that. I would love to see you guys there. Um, if you want an abbreviated copy of some of what we went over today, you can uh, go to our website that I think Kevin hopefully put in the chat. It is www.aldridgepele.com. Um, we'd love to hear more from you guys. And Andrea had a question, um, or Andrea, I'm probably saying it wrong. How does severe trauma, abuse, and neglect affect a two-month-old infant later in life who is then adopted in a healthy family at two months old? Ooh, we could talk about this all day. I will say that um, we need to remember that there are some individual factors of resilience. Some people, again, probably genetically seem to be able to bounce back. The bad news and the good news are the same when it comes to a young brain, that young brains are much more plastic. They're growing, they're kind of building a lot of those neural connections that make those neural networks and pathways. So it's kind of like a house that's being built and you're putting in all the wiring. The bad news is that abuse and neglect, and especially neglect, um, can cause pretty serious damage to a brain. There, will, there may be some systems that are overactivated, so you get a kid who's overly reactive. That's what we call reactive attachment disorder, um, that attaches very insecurely to people, so they can have very disrupted or bizarre reactions to people, have struggle, have struggle to you know, build relationships. Um, neglect in severe forms can actually cause some areas of the brain to grow insufficiently. Like literally, if you look at a brain scan, there's some areas that are smaller than they should be, or in extreme cases, didn't develop at all. And then you've got profound damage to lots of neurological operations and functioning. Um, however, as I said, there is good news, which is that a young brain is also very plastic. So I would say that if you get that kid at two months old, you've still got a lot of that window, two to, zero to two, zero to three, depending on what we're talking about, that the brain can also start kind of rewiring. So we may see a lot of damage, but there is still time to work within that, that window of, of high plasticity, high um, brain flexibility, if you will. And I would say this too, and maybe this is a good place to wrap up. Um, I have learned never to underestimate how much damage trauma can do at any time of a human being's life. But I've also learned, and I, I mean this 100% straight up, I have learned never to underestimate the healing capacity of a human being. So that kind of severe trauma early in life, do we ever get someone to a point where it's like it never happened? Um, probably not. But is there tremendous amounts of progress that can happen from someone with unimaginable damage? Yes, that's true too. So Andrea has followed up with us here. Again, forgive me if I'm saying your name wrong. She is 15 years old now and has blood curdling screams and runs away or beats up her mom. Yeah, she's struggling. Um, again, this is something that there are experts in this particular kind of trauma. I would not try to step in on that, but I would say that, that the diagnosis of reactive attachment disorder really captures a lot of the um, sometimes, unfortunately, lifelong challenges that people will have. So again, I would say that intensive, um, highly trained trauma therapy could probably be helpful. Never count someone out. But it's possible that, that some of the damage that she experienced um, in early infancy um, you know, it is still playing out in terms of her brain function. Um, okay. Uh, so I will wrap it up there because I know everybody's got places to be. Hopefully I will see you guys again next week and we will talk about trauma to some extent along with some other um, diagnostic categories and I'll wrap it up there. So thanks everybody. It was great to talk to you and uh, I hope to see you again.